The Ready, Set, Grow podcast is sponsored by Ag Expert, software designed for Canadian agriculture. Visit them today at agexpert.ca. Welcome to the Ready, Set, Grow podcast, where we like to showcase startup and early stage companies, as well as visit with innovators in the agriculture and food industry. Today, we're here with Diana Laternus and guest Haley Jeffries, co-founder of Prairie Fava. Haley, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Haley Jeffries, and I'm the co-founder of Prairie Fava. Um, we are a fava-focused company based out of Glenboro, Manitoba, which was, um, well, I guess we started market research about five years ago, but officially started processing in the fall of 2017. Currently, um, we sell fava ingredients um, to uh, businesses across Canada, um, processors, manufacturers, um, across Canada, the U.S., and we do a bit of exporting to Japan and Vietnam. So can you tell us a little bit more about your product yeah. and, and how you grow it and, you know, what, I haven't seen Fava a whole lot, so yeah, tell us more about it. Yeah, well, it all kind of, um, I, I didn't actually even know much about Fava myself five years ago. Um, and we had just, um, we were actually finishing school, my husband and I, in Ontario, and I was actually working in corporate sales. And there was an opportunity for him to join his fifth generation family farm in Glenboro, Manitoba. And at that time, um, we, uh, you know, we had moved back home and for him to join his family farm. And at that time, uh, Plant Base had just started getting some traction in the marketplace. And he was selling fava seed to other farmers. And he said, geez, you know, Haley, you're looking for a new career path since we've moved home. Why don't you look at market opportunities for fava beans? Um, at that time, too, my mother had become ill. And we were looking into other alternative protein sources for her. And once I started looking into fava beans, I realized um, how interesting they were and how underdeveloped they were, especially in the North American market. Um, so when I looked into it, favas are actually the highest protein out of all of the pulses. Um, they are also the most neutral in flavor. So when processed into ingredients like flours or protein sources, they're extremely neutral in flavor compared to the other protein sources that you see on the marketplace like pea. Um, the other interesting fact about favas is they're also the highest nitrogen fixing crop um, out of all the pulse crops. So all pulse crops are great for sustainability, um, you know, the future of sustainability and crop rotation for farmers, but favas actually um, fixes up to 90% of the nitrogen in the soil. So all of these things got me um, excited and being passionate about health and the environment. Um, I kind of decided to leverage my corporate sales um, passion to um, decide how we could market favas in the marketplace and um, share with the world how great favas are in North America as an ingredient. Mm -hmm. So what, what types of products do does fava go into uh, that's on the market today? Yeah, you see everything. It's really growing. Um, traditionally, uh, you know, overseas, you would see it more traditionally used like in a can, um, in falafels, in hummus. Um, but actually in the North American market, you're seeing um, uh, fava flowers being used in alternative meats. You're seeing um, the beans and the split beans being used in snack products. Um, you're seeing the proteins like the isolates and the, contra um, the concentrates used in not dairy products. So you're seeing it in a vast majority of products or even um, some extruded products and extruded means um, like snacks, like chips or puffs or anything that you would kind of munch on. So it's pretty versatile. Um, everything from the whole bean to the split bean to the flowers to proteins, um, very versatile across all products that you would see in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Does it grow the same way as all the other lentils, like in same growing uh, periods? Yeah, favas are, um, uh, they're easy to grow in the sense that they're, um, a higher standing crop, they're resistant to lodging, but they love water and um, they don't tend to like a lot of heat. <laughs> so they do best where it's a bit cooler and um, they definitely love moisture. Mm -hmm. Is More there a lot of people growing that th this type of crop? Across Canada, there's about, I would say across 
Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, on average, there's about 100,000 acres being grown. 100,000 acres. Yeah, that's quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a growing trend. And so people would rotate uh, to the fava crop if they wanted to increase their nutrients into the soil. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where, you know, we're seeing, especially in Saskatchewan and Alberta, aphanomyces um, is really affecting the pea crop. Um, due to, you know, possible lack of rotation. So favas could really take part in that proper um, crop rotation and be another pulse crop and giving another option to farmers. Mm -hmm. It's not affected by aphanomyces. Right. Are there other things that, um, you know, egg producers should know in terms of if they wanted to go into this type of crop uh, that, they, that they should look out for or how they would treat it or... Yeah, it's, you know what, um, there's definitely opportunities coming with fava bean um, and Prairie Fava, we actually own our own fava variety, which is a closed loop um, system. So we actually contract farmers to grow for us and then we will buy it back. Um, but there are so many different varieties on the marketplace. And I would still say, even with Prairie Fava's new variety, something I'm working on and, and a part of the industry um, conversations about is how to improve the agronomics of fava beans. I still think there's some work to do for farmers. Um, they do really thrive in um, cooler and wetter regions, but I, I still believe um, we have some work to do, especially to compete um, on a global scale and also to compete on a processing scale to make sure our quality is, um, is consistent, especially when looking into going into ingredients like flours and proteins. Uh -huh. So do you work closely with PIC, uh, the Protein Industries Cluster? Yeah, we recently, or I guess not recently, I don't know where time goes. Um, this summer, we anna PIC announced a project that we are a part of with um, Roquette. And we're very excited to collaborate, uh, especially with such a, a global um, leader in plant-based protein. And so uh, one of the project milestones is looking at a pea and fava protein blend. So that's super exciting to, for a small company like ourselves to have validation from such a large company that um, the future of fava is coming. That's awesome. And so what kind of marketing do you do in terms of the fava bean? Like out there, is there, you know, I, you probably have a website and that kind of thing, but can you share more about how you market? Yeah, we, right now, we're actually undergoing um, a, a whole new market strategy. Um, we started with a website and I started when I first started going to a lot of trade shows and networking events and obviously that's looking a little different these days. Um, but we are kind of undergoing a whole new uh, restructure of kind of how we work it um, because we have some, you know, we're kind of marketing to consumers with potentially launching a consumer brand and then we're also marketing B to just to, you know, direct to businesses. So we're undergoing a whole new strategy where we're totally separating it and making sure that our marketing is very clear to industry and what we do and what we supply to industry and then how we um, can get consumers excited about FAVA and educate um, on the consumer level as well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a very healthy product. And uh, <laughs> do you see more products uh, being made like in the snack uh, category and that in future? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's really, the snack category um, is fast paced and it's growing and there's lots of products out there that you're starting to see, especially a lot of Pulse product, uh, products being launched in the snack category, which is fantastic. And I think Fava can just fit right in there as part of line extensions. And, um, you know, due to its protein content and its um, pro taste profile, I think it really can thrive um, in the snack category and give consumers, you know, healthy products, but at the end of the day, you still want them to taste great. So I think that's the key. And I think fava can um, not affect the taste, but increase the nutrients. Right. So if I was cooking some stuff at home, um, what would I put it, uh, fava beans in? Soups or other types of products? Yeah, so for our split beans, um, you could do soups and dips and, um, you know, chilies, vegetarian chilies, meat chilies, blended products. Um, for the flowers, 
Um, we actually offer right now two flours. One is 100% fava flour and one is a fava blend. And the 100% is a great thickener. So it's great for gravies and um, uh, sauces, um, salad dressings, even pancakes because uh, they don't need extreme rising. But because it is a gluten-free flour, we did develop a fava blend, which is for consumers at home, it's much more beneficial for anything that needs rising. So cakes, cupcakes, muffins, um, cookies, and you could use it essentially as one-to-one -to, -one to your regular flour, but it would be gluten-free and higher in protein and fiber. Oh, that's perfect. So can you buy it at regular grocery stores or do you have to order it from you? Yeah. <laughs> no, not right now, but we're hoping so. Uh, it's on our long list of to-dos um, of looking at how we can um, get these products um, ourselves direct to consumers. Nice. So if people wanted to order some, they could go to your website to order some direct or... Right now, yes, we are taking pre-orders. It's not official, but we are working on it to be able to order direct from us and to kind of execute an e-commerce strategy around our Fava products. Right. So if you were talking to young entrepreneurs, um, what would you tell them if they were going into business? Well, I would tell them that it's gonna take a lot longer than you think. <laughs> and there's gonna be a lot of challenges. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun and um, do something that you can have fun in because there are so many uh, highs and there's so many lows as well. And so hopefully when you come across those challenges or those roadblocks, you can, um, you know, be so motivated because you're passionate about something to overcome those challenges and roadblocks. So you need some grit um, to be able to get through it. Uh -huh. And being a woman in agriculture, um, you know, what advice do you give other women that are, you know, trying to build businesses in this, in this space? Yeah, it's, it's a great space to be in. Um, I think there's so many, there's so much opportunity in ag. Um, there's so many great resources, especially for women in ag. Um, it's, it's amazing to see the support system that's out there. Um, I would say to any woman entrepreneurs or any entrepreneurs period is that navigating those resources, cause there's so many that can be a challenge and task on its own. Um, but don't hesitate to, to look into them, especially in Canada. We are, we are so fortunate of the support that we receive as young entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs across the board. So look, look into the resources that are available. Right. And so do you have like peer groups or mentor groups that or even um, forums where you talk about things um, that you could suggest? Yeah, one of the um, programs that kind of um, helped accelerate, you know, our network and uh, people that we know in the industry is we had applied for the District Ventures Accelerator Program um, that's ran by Arlene Dickinson from the Dragon's Den. Um, it's a great program to meet other entrepreneurs, to network. Um, there's investment opportunity. So that would be one that we were a part of. Um, even just, you know, knowing your industry and networking um, locally, you know, so being a part of um, different organizations. So for myself, it was important to, since supply chain is very important to our company, it was important to get involved with organizations like Manitoba Pulse and, you know, Pulse Canada um, to understand what's going on in the industry level. So for me, it's just networking with Entre you know, you can join networking programs for entrepreneurs, but then you sh can, should also join networking programs um, that's specific to your industry and what you're passionate about so you can um, be part of the movement you want to see change in. Mm -hmm. No, those are good suggestions. And do you have any like books or other resources that you rely on um, to get more information or to learn about? I love um, entrepreneurial stories. So for me and my partner will probably laugh that I'm saying this reference, but a huge, one of my favorite books right now and that I tell everybody about is I love the book Shoe Dog, um, the Nike story, the founder of Nike. I think it's just such a raw and real story of an entrepreneur's journey um, who built an extremely successful company, but just all of the ups and downs but then at the end of the day, how you look back and you want to do it all over again because it is a lot of fun. Yeah. 
Oh, that's, that's amazing. Cause yeah, you just don't know what the ups and downs are, but like you say, you look back and go, wow, like how far we've come. Right. Exactly. So yeah, no, you have an amazing story. Um, Michael, do you have other questions you want to ask? Bava beans haven't been traditionally used in like a lot of, I guess, North American diets. Uh, what's the biggest hurdle that you've seen sort of marketing it to uh, consumers here? Yeah, it's probably just the lack of education, um, just because it is, uh, just in general, consumers don't know much about pulses, right? We talk about pulses, meaning dried beans, chickpeas, and peas. And even that is so um, underdeveloped as a market. So then you throw in fava beans, which is an underdeveloped pulse. And so the education is definitely, they're like, what's a fava bean? And, you know, what does that do? And what do you, what do you mean? Um, but it's kind of like any new ingredient. Um, it takes a while to educate, but look at the hemp industry and look how far that has come. Look at even pea and look how far we've come with pea protein. Um, so I think there's just, it's just patience and persistence and showing the benefits in education. Um, but I would say that we're, we're fortunate that at this point in time, um, plant-based ingredients and the plant-based movement is so, um, uh, uh, present and is growing so fast and furiously that it's a really great time to talk about. And I have seen that co companies and consumers are so engaged in learning about new ingredients that they can incorporate, um, to be you know, to provide them better for you diets and healthier diets and more nutritious. Okay. Um, have you noticed a big difference uh, sort of between, I guess, the overseas market versus the Canadian market uh, in consumers? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, there is a market for fava beans overseas where Canada farmers struggle to market our fava beans overseas or has historically, from my perception, is our quality and our you know, logistical freight issues. Um, but there are definitely markets overseas and consumers are using them more traditionally just because they use more beans more traditionally anyways in the whole form or the split form. Where I would say in the North American market, we're seeing more of a push as the ingredients. So the flowers or the protein sources. Um, there's still consumers obviously using them actually since COVID, wanting to get back to basics and stock your pantry with beans. Um, but I think in the future, you're going to see more in the North American market, uh, using it as ingredients in, in various products that we see in the grocery stores. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, Thanks before we, that. before we head out, is there anything else uh, that you want to share? No, I just really appreciate you letting us, me talk about fava. I could talk about it all day. So thank you for giving me the platform. Okay. Um, how can our listeners uh, connect with you? Um, feel free to connect with us on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, or we do have an Instagram, so you're welcome to also connect with us there. Okay. And I just wanted to thank our listeners for tuning into the Ready, Set, Grow podcast. And thank you again, Haley, for joining us and talking about Prairie Fava. Thanks so much.